So hope is a heavily studied subject in psychology. And what psychologists are finding, well, basically to give you a quick, just a super quick history lesson, all the way up in, from basically the late 1800s to the late 1900s, so about 30 years ago, most psychologists believed and most psychological theories were based on what would be considered a past-present orientation. Even like people like Sigmund Freud and others, they believed that if you want to understand who a person was, you simply had to just take a look at their history, look at their past. And if we could understand a person's past, then we could understand why they are who they are. And, and, and so that's why there's that whole notion of sitting on the chair and starting to kind of spill out your history. Well, over the last 20, 30 years, research in neuroscience and in positive psychology has kind of flipped that script. For one, one thing that we now know very heavily about the brain is, is that the brain is essentially a prediction machine. Um, your brain is always predicting or anticipating what will happen in the future. And if you have an incorrect prediction, say that you, so right now you're even in your mind without even knowing it, anticipating, if you're listening very closely, you're already coming up with predictions about what's gonna happen next. Even without thinking about it. when you go and have a conversation, you do that. And when you make a mistake, where something is really different from what you expect, that's what's called a prediction error. And that, if you, take, if you pay close attention to that, that prediction error will then lead you to reframing your entire model of the world. Your memory is the model that you have of the world. And so when you have prediction errors, when things don't go as you expect, you readjust your perspective and then come up with new predictions based on that. So everything we do is based on the future that we anticipate. Um, but also, psychologists have spent a lot of time just thinking about human beings in general. And one thing that's very, very different about humans versus, call it, animals, plants, other species, is that humans spend about two-thirds of our time thinking about the future. But we think about not just one future. We're not just reactively you know, operating based on our situation. We're thinking about tons of different futures. They actually call this prospection in psychology. It's about prospects. We all have infinite prospects in our future. We could do this. We could do that. You know, we could go to this restaurant, that restaurant. Uh, I could make this shift in my career. I could do this or that. We're always thinking about infinite different prospects, different possibilities. And then ultimately, we end up making decisions about those prospects. We end up making decisions about where we want to go. We end up making a decision or ultimately committing to a path. Well, back to the idea of hope. And then we'll go a little bit more into prospection and then get you to future self. Hope from a psychological standpoint is a lot more than just I hope it happens. Um, going back to Viktor Frankl, hope was basically air. Like without hope in the future, the present was, was, and this is true of all of you. Honestly, think for a minute if you had zero hope for your future, like absolute zero hope. What would that do for your psyche? What would that do for your energy? What would that do for your soul? Uh, you would feel crushed if you had zero hope. And so from a psychological standpoint, hope is three things. And then I'm going to kind of show you some of the differences. So basically, it's this. And they've, and they've spent a lot of time studying high hope people versus low hope people. But in order to have what psychologists would call high hope, first you have to have clear and committed goals. Interestingly, commitment comes before hope. So for Frankl, as an example, he had to commit to something in his mind, and that commitment actually enabled him to have hope. Without that commitment, there can't be hope. And so it really is interesting that commitment is the foundation, and I'm going to explain more about identity in a second, and it's going to connect, connect a few dots for you. But Viktor Frankl actually explicitly wrote in Man's Search for Meaning what his committed goal was that gave him the grit and resilience, or in other words, that allowed him to bear any how. So his goal, actually, before he went into the concentration camp, he had written his first book. He had the whole manuscript written. It was called The Doctor and the Soul. And it was all about his perspectives, his theories about meaning, about resilience, about having meanings or goals or purposes to fulfill in the future, and his belief that a person's mental well-being and their psychology in the present is far more based on their connection to their purpose and goals in the future than to anything else. And so your own mental well-being, and even actually, interestingly, researchers have found that far more important than the quality of sleep you had the night before, it is actually your expectation the night before of what the day is going to be like. If you have really positive expectations, for example, for how tomorrow is going to go, that is going to dictate your day more than even the quality of your sleep. And so Frankl 
while he was in the second concentration camp because he got moved from concentration camp to concentration camp. He had his manuscript hidden. That was actually the only thing. Like in the rush of getting taken and captured, he took his manuscript, he hid it, and he protected it with his life. And then when he got taken to the second concentration camp, they found it and they took it and they shredded it. This was before they had, you know, windows or stuff like that. So like they took his thing and tore it apart. And so he says in the book, and I wish I had put it in the slides, but whatever, he said that his deep desire to rewrite his book and publish it gave him the strength and ability to withstand the rigors of the camps. What he would end up doing was at nights, he would sneak like little scraps of paper from, from one of the offices and he would jot down thoughts in his head and then stick it in his coat pocket. And so he had this why that enabled him to bear any how. He had a clear and committed goal, a future self that enabled him, that gave him meaning. And interestingly, very interestingly, going back to the idea that the past, present, and future are actually simultaneous, that's actually called holistic psychology. We, you know, the past, present, and future are holistic. Also, when you change one simultaneously, you change all the others. You change your view of the future, it's actually gonna change your orientation in the present and your views of your own past. And you're always reconstructing your views of the past and the present. So my view of my, my childhood is gonna be very different from the 15-year-old person who was having that experience. I'm always reconstructing my view of the past in the present. But that was how he pursued, and that was what he tried to help other people do. So that's the first thing. High hope people have clear and committed goals, very committed goals. The second one is a concept called pathways thinking. This is more like strategy. So there's a quote, you know, when the why is strong enough, you'll find the how. It's not just that you can bear any how, but that you will actually find the how. So this is the second, and this is a model that's very big in psychology. You could look up enormous studies on this topic. Um, but pathways thinking is the idea that if you are clear and committed on a goal, that you will eventually find the way. That's the pathways thinking. And one of the things that they've found with low hope people, first off, low hope people generally don't have clear and committed goals. Commitment is the operative word, truly commitment. Most people are committed to the present, not to the future. Um, but, but also, so they don't generally have clear and committed goals, but secondly, when it comes to pathways thinking, what happens to low hope people, and they've studied this on students, salespeople, all sorts of people, is people with a low hope orientation, they'll go at a certain strategy, something that's comfortable to them. They'll try to you know, do it their own way, and when they hit roadblocks, rather than using the roadblocks as feedback for learning and ultimately to iterate and adjust their strategy, what they do is, is they hit a roadblock, then they disengage and ultimately distract themselves. Think about it, hop on Facebook, distract themselves, have conversations with people to justify why things aren't going very well, and then ultimately they go back to doing the same thing and expecting a different result, which is what Einstein would call insanity, trying the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And so high hope people, they use feedback from not achieving their goals as diagnostic, basically, information. This didn't work, but I can use this as information to ultimately shift and try something new. They're always iterating and adjusting. One of my favorite quotes actually from an entrepreneur named Naval Ravikant. He said, it's not 10,000 hours that makes an outlier, which is what Malcolm Gladwell said, it's actually 10,000 iterations. It's always learning from every experience and iterating, adjusting, and improving what you're doing. Taking every experience and saying this is happening for me, not to me. It does not matter if it doesn't go well. It doesn't matter if you don't succeed. Every experience you can use as fuel to continuously learn and increase your commitment and upgrade your perspective. So when the why is strong enough, you will find the how. And if you look at your life, if you look at what you're doing right now versus what you were doing six months ago, hopefully your pathways are a lot better. Your strategies are a lot better. Maybe your goals are a lot bigger and clear, but hopefully over the last six months, you've learned a lot through trial and error. One of the big aspects of having a quote unquote growth mindset is, is the embracing of failure because people with a growth mindset are not attached to their identity in the present. They don't really care. I don't really care about my views so much right now because I know that my views right now are very temporary. My future self is gonna see things very differently in even a week from now. So people with quote unquote a fixed mindset, they're very aware of their current perspective and they strive to defend it. And if you're trying to defend something, that means that you're stuck in the past. And so they have what would be considered a fragile identity. Because they're trying so hard to prove their current perspective or their current competence, 
or that they think that they know what they're doing, they become very closed off to feedback, closed off to learning, and very avoidant of failure. Because they don't, because having a failure would kind of tell them something negative about themselves because they have a very fixed view of themselves. Whereas if you know that your future self is gonna be very different. If I know in a, a week from now that I'm gonna be far more informed than I am right now, I'm gonna have a lot more perspective because I'll have courageously been going and striving for things and gotten a lot of feedback, some good, some bad. But I know I'll know better. And so I don't need to try to prove my current perspective. I can just be open. That's pretty much what a growth mindset is, is, is that you don't overly worry so much about your current identity because your current self is extremely temporary. The final component is what's called agency belief, which is essentially the growth mindset or the, the belief that you actually have the ability to make decisions. Uh, psychologists would also call this an internal locus of control where you believe you have agency, you believe you can make choices, and you also believe you can direct your attention. I can direct my attention towards what I want and I can also ignore the things that aren't useful. Um, this is called selective attention in psychology, that whatever you focus on, whatever you think about, you create more of. Whatever you focus on, you become more of. And so I can choose where I focus. I can also shield out and block out a lot of the noise that doesn't really matter, that's not helpful. So these are the three clear components of hope. Without these things, you're probably not operating very powerfully in the present. You're also not learning an enormous amount and squeezing intense juice out of every experience. Thank you for watching this highlight video from the Sandler Summit. You can join us for the next Sandler Summit in 2024, March 19th and 20th at the Orlando World Center Marriott. Register now at sandler.com summit.